our civil society organizations that are present here with a specific focus on the leadership of the civil society organizations, that's the Southern Hub, which is Kima Foods, and uh, our partner in the national uh, office, Emily, together with our facilitator who is here with us today, Dr. Michael Mboga. Once again, I'll say you're welcome to Kabarole District, but also I know some of you could be not your first time being in Kabarole because most of the faces here we've once met in this particular room and most of us are from the southern Alberta and again this is our almost uh, central district for all the activities. So Guanacao, thank you first uh, for ensuring that you accommodated us within your district but also honoring this invitation and you taking your time to be here. I know it's a busy schedule out in the office there but you taking that particular time is of importance to us. There's WWF together with the Minister of Water being represented, but also with the Academia Makerere University being represented here and the entire CS course. But specifically for this day, uh, we're here for something very simple. And just like uh, Edith already highlighted, we're here for a climate change adaptation training. And just like she highlighted, this big elephant called climate change, we all understand it differently. But as WWF, the World Wide Fund for Nature, of course, at the end of the day, our mission is to build a future in which humans live in harmony with nature. But we're saying if we build a future in which humans live in harmony with nature, we should be doing this with all other partners because we will not do it alone. But again, we're saying we will do this by conserving the world's biological diversity. But we will also do this by ensuring that we use the natural resources sustainably, which we depend on for our livelihoods. But also we will do this by ensuring that at the end of the day, we reduce on pollution, but also ensure that we're sustainable in our consumption patterns. But of course, having that mission broad, you realize that at the center of all this is the human being. And thereafter, nature exists. So as a conservation organization, we now realize that as we address threats to conservation, and this threats could be deforestation, this threats could be poaching, and they are already known, there is another threat that in one way or the other becomes a multiplying threat. What makes that person to cut a forest for livelihood is because his agriculture is not doing very well. What makes him to annex the land of the forest is because his agriculture is not doing very well. And possibly, it may be because of climate change. So we realize that at the end of the day, climate change comes as a bigger challenge and poses a risk that in one way or the other multiplies even the other, other challenges we are addressing. So that means we have to be conscious and put much more effort in addressing some of those climate change threats we are already realizing within the Alberta and Rabin, but specifically for the Renzori region. You realize that, of course, what maps us out of the Renzori region is our Mount Renzori. Everybody knew that it's one of those mountains around the equator with snow. But before now, a few years, certain years back, you now see the snow is receding. Supposing if it continues for another 100 years, will our children be able to see this snow and the mountains and Brazil? So the onus is on all of us to participate and to take charge. It could be from government, who are solely our duty bearers represented by the power and the ministry. Or it could be from us, civil society, who connect with the community and take some of these services right the community, but also supplement government efforts. Or it could be from the academia, who research on this information and give us the reliable information that we can be able to use for advocacy. So that's why as WWF, we have been programming on four key areas. Our first programming is on sustainable forest management, which is on forestry. But also our second programming is on sustainable water catchments. How do we look at these watersheds and maintain them in such a way that at the end of the day they provide the right amount of water in terms of quality and quantity that us as people can survive and the uh, uh, ecosystems can also thrive. 
but also within program on energy and climate, and that's why we're here. On our programming on energy and climate, we look at two issues. We already acknowledge that climate change is happening, so we're going to look at mitigating climate change, but also we're going to look at adapting to climate change. So in our, in our attempt to address mitigation to climate change, this is where we are already promoting one of our key programs on energy access. And we're simply saying, can we ensure that we increase access to sustainable, affordable, and renewable energy technologies and the corresponding services? Could be sustainable energy for cooking, could be sustainable energy for lighting, could be sustainable energy for productive use. And as civil society, again, ours is torch away and then be able to present this to government. Then government has duty bearers should be in one way or the other be able to allocate resources. So we supplement what government is supposed to do. So that is on our response to mitigation. But we do that at the local level, ensuring that communities adopt these technologies, but we also do it at the national level, trying to advocate to cities, say Kampala City Council Authority, how do we address some of the mitigation issues around transportation in the city, around infrastructure development in the city. So those are some of the things that we do. But together now, advocating to government to be able to allocate some resources around some of these initiatives, which we may be doing in one or the other, but trying to see how we do it in a much more scaled manner. But having looked at mitigation on the energy side, we also say at the end of the day we have to look at adaptation. Climate change is already happening. Temperatures are already rising. Rainfall is unpredictable. So what should we be doing? The WWF again, together with our partners, we should be able to promote adaptation. How do we address those specific climate risks? And that's why we are here today to now first be able to address the key challenges in trying to adapt to climate change. Because those critical challenges are two. One of the challenges is a knowledge challenge. Do we really understand what climate change adaptation is? So we should be able to address that. And as civil society, working together with academia and the ministry, can we first be able to understand what is this whole issue of climate change? So that even when we advocate to government and also work with communities, we know the principles to which we are working on the particular subject. Because it should be based on knowledge. So our advocacy should be knowledge-based. But also, on the other side, we should also be able to look at the financing challenge. We could be having all the knowledge in adaptation. We could be knowing all these options, but how do we finance these options so that communities are able to adapt to them? So that financing challenge, we know so of in this room today, but it's one of the things we should be thinking, and one of the things uh, the cow through his office uh, for the district local government, but also uh, Dr. Musoke for the ministry to see in this climate change issue, the biggest challenge is financing. How do we finance climate change adaptation at all levels? Then we should be able to achieve that future in which we see people and nature thrive in a changing climate. Whereas all these challenges that we already know within the resolve, we should be able to address it. So that's why WWF came up with one initiative, again as a civil society, we come with these small initiatives as pilot initiatives that should catalyze action. And that action then government should be able to take forward, or any other institution should be able to take forward and scale it at a community level. But also, as we came up with this initiative, we could not work alone as WWF, we had to work with our sister civil society organizations, and that's why we're working together with the Environment Management for Livelihood Improvement, WISE facility, Emily in Kampala, that in one way or the other they have demonstrated that they can be able to advocate and work with others on issues of climate change. Then we are now also partnering with one of the civil society within the Southern Albert and Graben uh, Conservation for Development Agency, uh, CODEA, and they are now involved in ensuring that at the end of the day, with the small resources, can we be able to demonstrate to these communities what climate change adaptation is? but also what are those specific climate threats we are addressing and how are we addressing them. Because just like it is said, climate change adaptation in one way or the other confuses. 
It may be business as usual, or it may be business that may not be usual. So that's why we really need this particular two days to be here. We are fewer here because, just like we said, it's a pilot. So we have limited resources. So the people who are here should be ambassadors to go out back to your organizations, also retrain them to understand some of these critical issues. Then thereafter, implementation can be started. But the most important thing, we will pick the knowledge, but also share your own experiences on what this could be. Because in one way or the other, you could have done it, but maybe you would not think in that before you are addressing some of the issues that are climate change. So that's why the Africa Adaptation Initiative came to birth. And the Africa Adaptation Initiative is a project that is running for three years, started from 2017 up to 2020. But specifically, this project is aimed at enhancing the social and ecological resilience of both uh, people and uh, ecosystems to climate change. And of course, realizing that climate change impacts differ according to areas, so they are much more area-specific. So what will be a climate threat in Kassese may not be the same climate threat in Kisoro and may not be the same climate threat in Arua. So those specific climate stress have to be identified, and thereafter, we address both what are those issues that affect people, but also what are those issues that affect nature. So that at the end of the day, both the ecosystems that we depend on to get the ecosystem services, but also us as people, we should be able now to reduce our vulnerability to climate change and to build our resilience at the end of the day. So that's why we're here for this specific two days. I will not talk much, but that was just to introduce to you what is our thinking together with civil societies working on the issues of climate change, but advocating to governments and working with academia to pick on that knowledge side that is evidence-based advocacy as we move into climate change agenda. So with those few remarks, I end there and I wish us Good deliberation in two days and good learning for all of us. Thank you.